In this video, we're going to be taking a look at another old music format. Now, with this one, whilst it's more than likely you haven't heard of it, it's quite possible that you've actually heard it itself being played somewhere. As long as you're old enough, that is. I'll explain more in a moment. Now, if you've been following this channel for a while, you'll have seen I've done quite a few videos about old music formats, from more common things like the Philips Compact Cassette to more interesting rarities like this little thing here. If you didn't see the video on this one, this is the Sony NT. It's the smallest music cassette format ever made. Not to be confused with the larger micro or mini cassettes that you might see in a telephone answering machine or a dictaphone. No, the Sony NT is a digital format on tape. And this little thing here can hold up to 120 minutes of really pretty decent quality sound. Now, if I've done a video about the smallest music cassette ever made, it follows that I should really do one about the largest, which is what this video is about. But it's taken me a couple of years to get this together because trying to find working equipment and the cartridges to play on it has been hard work. But I finally managed to get everything together and I can show it to you here today. And the format I'm talking about is this thing here. This is the largest cartridge ever made and it's the 3M Cantata. 700. Now, you probably haven't heard that name mentioned before, but the reason you might have heard the music itself is because this wasn't something that was sold to the home market. Now, this is sold to businesses as a background music system. Yes, this is the thing responsible for that awful music that you might have heard played in public buildings if you were around in the 1970s and 80s. And apparently some places were even using it into the 90s. It did come out to start with in the 1960s, but it seems like some people just stuck with the old technology and kept using it until something better came along, which didn't happen for a long time. Now you could get a lot of different types of cartridges for this one, but they're all featuring music that's been played by the 3M Orchestra, which is uh, their own version of popular hits of the time. So it is proper music. It's not really all that enjoyable to listen to, but I'm going to play some of it to you later on. And to be honest, it's the technology more than the music that I find interesting with this one. So let's have a look at it in a little bit more detail. The 3M Cantata 700 was actually introduced in 1965. We can see it mentioned in this issue of Billboard here, and you can see below the picture there, it gives a little bit of information about the specs of it. And also at the bottom there, it says the price to purchase one of these was $429. So that's 1965 prices. If we convert that into the current price, that's approximately $3,243. That's quite an expensive device. Now, the company behind this were 3M, and those 3M stand for the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company. Yes, they started off in 1902 in the mining business, but over the years they pivoted, changed what they were doing, and perhaps one of their most famous products is Scotch tape. Now, Scotch tape can either be that sticky stuff that you hold things together with, or it could be magnetic recording tape. 3M introduced their first magnetic recording tape in 1947, and the Scotch brand ran all the way up to the late 1990s. In the 60s, when this device came out, it was probably the thing that they were most famous for. You can kind of understand in a way why they'd want to package up their own recording tape inside a cartridge and sell it as a background music machine, but it's still slightly odd. Now, when this device was introduced, there were a choice of just two cartridges, but throughout the lifetime of the product, a number of different cartridges came out. All of them featured 700 beautiful high-fidelity music selections without title repetition, scientifically programmed to assure the ultimate in background music. Well, I think we'll be the judge of that. We'll have a listen later on. Now, the boxes I've got here are all in very good condition, and you can see at the bottom here, they've all got different names. Variety Library, Rhythmic Library, Melodic Library, and Rhythmic Library Series to all in caps. Mm. Now, the boxes themselves are quite nicely constructed, as you can see here. We've got a slip case inside that goes around the cartridge there. And you've got a metallic label on there. It all looks very smart, really. We'll just take that out of there. Reassuringly heavy as well. We've got a sticker at the bottom right here telling us what not to do. Of course, you'd get somebody in the or store, office, whatever, swap these over. Uh, this sticker on the back here, if we get this in the light, 
just right. We better see when somebody actually had this cartridge in use. You can see on the right there, 72 to 75 they were using that. So for three years, somebody just kept playing this cartridge in this device. Now we've got a big speaker on the right there. On the left of the machine itself, we've got a indicator light to say whether it's on at the top left. We've got an on off button below that. And at the bottom here, we've got a volume control, which also has a treble and bass arm that you can sort of adjust that around the outside. Let's put a cartridge in here. You lift the top up and you drop it into this large area here. So waggle it in. And we've got a control here. This is the timer control. I'm not exactly sure what it's supposed to do, but anyway, that's the timer control. Now on the back of the box here, uh, you'll notice something. This is a 230 volts version. Now that is very rare. I've only ever seen these in the US before. I managed to get hold of this one in Germany and it's rare to see a European version. On the right hand side, we've got a speaker output so we can pipe this off to a number of speakers around the office or wherever we are. We've got a microphone input so we can do announcements over those speakers. And on the base of it, we've got a fan that runs continuously whenever it's powered on because no doubt this thing will get quite warm because it'll probably be shoved away in a cupboard somewhere. Anyway, let's have a listen to it. Let's have a look at this cartridge. You'll have noticed that it's a bit of an unusual design. The tape actually runs from the reel on the bottom, goes around a bit there and goes on the reel at the top. At least that's what it does in one direction. However, it reverses itself and does the opposite once it reaches the end. You're about to see here a very rare occurrence when it gets to the end of the tape. And it just pulls that little bit there operates the switch and then it goes in the opposite direction but also the playhead moves onto the other tape so i'll just show you here look at the playhead it's at the top position at the moment so i'll reverse the tape again and it goes onto the bottom one and the direction of the tape reverses We'll just take a look at the mechanism in a little bit more detail by removing the cartridge off the machine. If you look towards the back left there, there's a pin sticking up. That's the brake engaging mechanism. That goes inside the cartridge and pulls on this part here whenever you turn the machine on. And that releases a brake which is against the reels to stop them unraveling. We've got the center spindle here which rotates when it's moving. And towards the front here, you can see the playhead and that bar on the right pulls the tape towards the playhead when it's engaged and you can see the pinch roller moving on the top there as well. Now when you reach the end of a reel of tape there's a little metal pin embedded in the tape which pulls that part there and that's what drops the head down and starts playing everything in the other direction. Now we'll have a look inside one of these cartridges. I have to do this because this one's actually got a little bit stuck inside so we'll see what's in here. Take the lid off there. I'll show you the brake there. You can see back left so when you turn it on it pulls that. There's a little bit of rubber there that's against those reels to stop them moving. Now that piece of rubber there is a little bit of a problem. I'll mention why in a minute. You can see here it's got stuck to this tape and uh, it does have a habit of getting a bit sticky. Here is one out of another tape and just look, it's turned to sticky mush and that was a heck of a mess to try and get off the tape and off those reels. But anyway, yeah, the rubber's sort of perished over the years. Now by my measurements, the reels inside the cartridge are approximately eight and a half inches across. They contain normal quarter inch tape and the program that's recorded onto them is in mono. I'll show you how it goes across inside the cartridge here. So you can see the tape goes round that wheel there along the top through this metal guide over that piece of plastic it just slides over there twists round and goes along the bottom and back onto the other reel that goes in the opposite direction you can see it a little bit better from the side here now you might be wondering how long is on one of those cartridges and it was something that was puzzling me as well i did a lot of research online and nobody could say so let's try and figure this out 
the machine runs at one and seven eighths inches per second. Now that's very slow for recordings of the time. Uh, normal reel-to-reel -reel tape with recordings on it that you'd buy in the 60s and 70s had two different options. You could add seven and a half inches per second. Those were the higher quality recordings that usually cost more. And then three and three quarters, which is half that. Uh, and that was on a lot of sort of later releases when things got a little bit cheap, but it was all right, the sound. And reel-to-reel -reel machines have a setting you can see in the middle there, tape speed for those two different speeds. They don't go as slow as one and seven eighths inches per second that the Cantata 700 does. Not really recommended for music recording, maybe just dictaphones and things, but of course it is background music, so it doesn't really have to be that high fidelity. Anyway, back to the original question. How long can you get on one of these cartridges? Well, I recorded it playing for an hour, and you can see here all the individual songs there. And I counted those up, and there were 27 songs in a 60-minute period. So if we get the calculator out, if we start with 60 minutes divided by 27, we can see that each song averages out at 2.2 minutes each, which is quite short, really, for music. Of course, they are saying that they've got 700 tracks on here, but it's a little bit sneaky having them so short. But that's why it's called the Cantata 700. The 700 refers to the number of tracks on a tape. Anyway, how long are 700 tracks? Well, let's work that out. 700... Divided by 27 in an hour, 25.9 hours. So approximately 26 hours of music on each tape. And remember this thing plays one way, then plays the other way, then plays the other way again. It just goes on and on and on. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that it was quite tricky to get this video together. Originally, I got the cartridges for it well over a year ago, but trying to find a working machine was a lot more tricky. The eagle-eyed amongst you might have noticed I've got a bit of a sticky pinch roller here, but that really is the least of my troubles. When I first got the machine, it just didn't work at all. It did power on, but just nothing engaged properly. It took quite a bit of uh, contact cleaning and greasing and moving things around before the thing finally freed up. Even then, it still didn't quite match up inside. There's a lot going on inside one of these things. There's no belts in it. It's just a series of wheels that sort of push against each other. And one of those drive wheels in mine wasn't quite engaging. So I bought a parts machine. Now, here it is. You can see there, there's a sticker BP Marina. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, this machine is from the US and it's had it as you can see also at the bottom there notice patent applied for it's a very early one but it was completely non-functioning a very early circuit board compared to mine and it's a salt and things it looks like over the controls there which goes with the marina theme uh, look at the pinch rollers here Look at that salt on there. I think they use this thing as an anchor. I don't think they were playing any music back on this. And just look how sticky those have got. That is the big problem with these machines. So my slightly sticky pinch roller isn't that big a deal after all. You can see the mechanism again here. I can show you on this one a little bit easier. This wheel turns around and moves the uh, play head up and down. Now I've taken this one apart so I can show you a little bit more detail how it's fitted together. It's like a sandwich and in between there there's just so many different components and wheels and levers and springs. Uh, it's no wonder the thing doesn't really match up properly. It's just asking too much after this length of time. Now I did take all the screws out of this thinking I'll try and figure out how these things go apart so maybe I could take mine apart and try and get it all to work a little bit better. But despite taking every single screw out of it I still can't get the thing apart. It's still stuck together. So I've just left mine the way it is. I don't dare try and repair it any more than I already have done. What I did do though, this was the wheel that was in it, it's just really shiny, it wasn't engaging on anything, it was just sliding. So I took the one out of the one that's been used as an anchor and surprisingly that one is a better wheel. It's a little bit uh, uh, grippier than the one I had so that enabled me to get the machine at least working but it's not working perfectly and I'll demonstrate that to you now. Earlier on in the video I did a little bit of a sneaky trick because this is what it actually sounds like when it's playing. Uh, 
Yeah, there's a load of things rattling around, uh, not properly engaging and slipping inside. So to get it to sound decent, I figured out if I put it on its side like this, I could actually record the sound and then that's what I dubbed over earlier on when I was showing the machine to you. So apologies for the uh, deception, but it's the only way that I could really demonstrate the proper sound quality of this to you and it still sounds a little bit ropey on its side. Now when 3M brought this machine out, they did something slightly unusual. Before their most background music devices had been leased, they decided to sell the machine to people and then presumably hoped that they'd buy additional tapes over the years. They even introduced tapes that had country music and I've seen Polynesian, all sorts of different ones. And uh, unfortunately though, on eBay, if you go looking for these, you'll tend to find one tape over and over again, if you manage to find any that is, over a couple of year period, all I found is this one, V168, the Variety Music Library. That's the same one that I've got, it's the pink box, mine looks a little bit better than that. However, I don't think that there's many people who bought this machine did anything other than just get the machine and V168, so that's what they played over and over until everyone in the office or whatever went completely mad. Perhaps getting a tiny bit of respite at Christmas when the Christmas tape came out. So you can see why 3M, when they brought out a replacement machine in 1970, a new, updated, neater, smaller model, they decided to do that one on the lease agreement again. And that's why you'll never find one of those, because presumably they took them all back at the end of the lease. And that's why you can only find this previous model, the Cantata 700 now. Well, I hope you've enjoyed looking at this rather unusual machine from the 1960s. Hopefully, I've managed to show you something here that you haven't seen before. The world's largest music cartridge being played. Not something you get to see every day. Definitely something that I haven't seen until I managed to pick one up. I really do hope, though, that nobody had to listen to Variety Music Library 168 over and over again in the 70s and 80s, because I might have just brought back some nightmares. Anyway, that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching. Ooh.